Ever been in a situation so creepy it gave you chills? In this video, people share their eeriest encounters that still haunt them. Get ready for some spine-tingling stories, and don't forget to subscribe for more like this. The one thing that happened to me that I will never be able to put into a logical explanation is the one time I was brushing my teeth in my old house, and a plastic cup holding a few toothbrushes lifted itself up and jolted towards me. This happened in my old home. Me and my brother had always felt something was weird about the house. We have experienced minor things before, like noises, voices, guitar strings plucking themselves, door handles jiggling, and TVs turning on overnight. But seeing the cup lift itself up and move in an intelligent way on its own really turned me into a believer in the unknown. I know it's not much, but the thought of it still sends shivers down my spine every time I picture it in my head. I have since moved from the house, I was 17 when it happened, and I was completely sober, and the last thing I was concerned with was ghosts before it happened. I literally ran into my room, closed the door, and called my girlfriend and stayed on the phone with her for two hours before I finally went to sleep. This isn't paranormal, but I was almost abducted. I was in Indiana with three friends for a birthday party, four hours from where I live, in sixth grade. We were messing around, riding around the town on bikes and stuff of the sort. We came upon this secluded basketball court. This old guy comes out of a house next to us and begins to lurch over to us. He asks us where we live and if we would like to ride with him to the local ice cream parlor. My friend began to tell him where we were staying, but I cut him off and said that we had to go. We walk ran back to a main road without looking back, but when I finally did look back, I saw him, slowly lurching after us. To this day, every time I think of him and his stained wife beater, I get chills. About seven years ago, when I was in middle school, I often had to wait at the school for an hour or more because I couldn't ride the buses and had to wait to be picked up. To pass the time, I often spent my hour, or even longer in some cases, on the side of the school, where I could watch a multitude of cars go by and sometimes see a stray cat roam around. I had always liked cats, and so did the man who lived next door to the school. One day when I tried to pet one of the stray cats I found, the cat ran over to the man who lived next door. That was really the first time I was able to introduce myself and where he could do the same. He told me he had seen me hang around the edge of the school quite a lot and that he noticed I had wanted to pet some of the stray cats. He had told me that a lot of stray cats visited his home because he often left food out, and I was welcome to come over if I wanted to enjoy their company. I declined that day because it was pretty close to the time I was about to be picked up, and not to mention I had been warned to stay away from strangers. However, over the next few days the man repeatedly asked me if I would like to come over, being a child who loved animals, I couldn't refuse the prospect of playing with kittens over waiting in a parking lot. He led me to his back porch, where there were quite a few cats coming and going, though some seemed a little afraid of my presence. I wanted to reach out and pet one as I was about to ask a question, but the man put a finger to his lips as he told me in a whisper, they'll run away if you make any noise. I drew back a little and nodded as I just watched for a while, eventually a few of the braver, or possibly curious, cats ventured closer. I was even able to pet a few, and that soon became my afternoon ritual on the weekend. However, when I was reaching my final days of middle school and about to advance to junior high school, the man asked me if I would still come by to see him and the cats. I told him that I wasn't really sure if my parents would let me, which gave him a rather stern expression. We didn't talk much after that, and any day afterwards, when I came to play with the cats, he never came outside. On my final day of waiting on the middle school grounds, I knocked on the back porch door for the last time, I wanted to say goodbye at the very least. I didn't notice it at the time, but I didn't see any cats hanging around the porch this time. It wasn't the same man that I knew that answered the door, I could see similarities, but he was much younger. He looked a little confused, and I asked him about the older man who lived here. He told me that he was the only one who lived here other than his father before him. I told him that was who I wanted to talk to, but he quickly informed me that his father hasn't been a part of this world for at least 20 years. I asked him if he was joking, but he didn't find the whole situation very funny. Before he could tell me that I should leave, I excused myself. It was time for me to go anyway, maybe it was best not to think about it. As years passed me by, I started to think that maybe I just imagined the whole thing out of boredom. A group of friendly cats was certainly more interesting than sitting in a parking lot, but that never explained why I never met the older man's son before. Eventually I came to forget about it until my family decided to move out of our neighborhood. We moved somewhere a little closer to the high school I was currently going to, and it was just our luck that there was a cheap house available in the area. We moved into the home right next to the one where the old man had lived, which made me think about the whole situation all over again. 
My first few nights in the new house were spent wrestling with thoughts about what was real and what wasn't, until each night my thoughts were broken by a faint meow of a sickly sounding cat. Each night I heard it, I sat up in bed instantly and looked around. I never saw a thing but the empty space in my new room, I was almost convinced I was just imaging the whole thing. A few nights had passed where I never heard the sound of the cats again, finally letting me think in peace and try to drift off to sleep and rest assured that everything was only taking place in my head. Until I finally heard the sound of a cat once more, this time closer than all the rest. I sat up a few moments after hearing it, thinking there wasn't any chance that I'm just hearing things this time. When I sat up, my eyes instantly went to the corner of my bedroom. There was the old man with his back to me, kneeling over a small orange tabby. I didn't speak, I couldn't speak. I didn't know what to do until he turned his head to look at me. My widened eyes locked onto his own before he placed a finger in his mouth. They'll run away if you make any noise. I'm positive this wasn't a dream because I was talking to someone. I may have been hallucinating from sleep deprivation, but this has never happened to me before or since. I was talking on the phone while in bed when something on my desk fell over. Think it was a cup, it must have been the wind. My blinds were moving around, and I was like. But then I realized my windows weren't open at all, but they were moving as if the wind was pushing and pulling on them. Zero. Oh what? My TV turns off by itself. Me being the non-believer I am. Must have been the sleep timer. Turn the TV on, my box wasn't working, no cable at the time, just a DTV box. I realized the box was off. Go to try and plug in the box, both are unplugged. But the TV was still on somehow, it was just the black screen you get that says line because I have an old TV. Now I'm concerned. I better get the hell to sleep then. As soon as I turn the TV off, bang fall crash everything on my desk that was standing in some way, cups, deodorant, lamp, etc., all fell over in the exact same direction. Toward the door. Yell like fuck. I hang up with the person I'm talking to and run out my door. OMG what the hell, that was either the biggest breeze ever, or I am hallucinating. I open the door, and my blinds are no longer moving, but they were opened, leaving the windows clearly exposed, showing that they were closed. Look around, everything in the room is facing me because they all fell to point to my door. I was a little creeped out, so I'm like, okay, I'm just getting some water, going to the bathroom, and sleeping. Friend calls back what happened? Are you okay? I had finished my water and bathroom trip and was walking back to my room. Yes, everything on my desk just got blown over by a gust of wind, and I didn't want everything to break, and the noise startled me. I opened my door. My friend, well, maybe it's just time for you. Interrupted by my yelp, and I immediately hang up. I walked into the room to hit my foot on the tennis racket I dropped on the floor. I looked down, the foam finger I thought I lost a few years back was pointed at me like it wanted me to get out. Ran out of my room and texted my friend. I'm just going to go. Bye, I'm fine, just tired. Okay, good night? I sleep on the couch. I wake up in my bed, but the robe I was in was on the couch outside, and the foam finger was on my desk, and everything on my desk was fine and not toppled over. Christ, what a weird dream. Go to school, see my friend. Dude, what happened to you last night? Um. Nothing? Why were you yelling and shit? How did you know I had a bad dream? What dream, you screamed and hung up on me twice. He pulls out his phone, and I see my text. But it was different than I remember. Instead of saying, I'm just going to go. Bye, I'm fine, just tired, which is what I remember, his inbox and my sent message box both say. Okay, just need to stay out of my room. The weird part is I had just moved into that room, it was my dad's old office, and I liked being on the ground floor better. It was almost like I was being evicted. But by inanimate objects. My grandparents had a large old house outside of Baltimore, MD, where they raised my dad and his four siblings. When it came time for my dad and his siblings to sell the house, my grandfather died before I was even born and my grandmother was in a nursing facility because she had Parkinson's and had lost her legs to diabetes, they decided the best way to do it would be an auction that included anything left in the house. For months before the auction, my dad and mom combed the house for things that were important or valuable and should be taken before the sale. The day of the auction, my dad did one last walkthrough. He went into his old bedroom, looked around, and walked back out. On the floor of the hallway, he saw a piece of paper lying face down, even though he had just been in the hallway and the floor had been clear. He picked it up and turned it over. It was a picture of my grandparents that he had never seen before, and they looked really sad. 20 years ago, when I was 8 and living in San Diego, California at the time, my dad was in the Navy and we lived in military housing, 
I had an experience that has since made me develop a phobia of windows with no curtains or blinds of any sort shut at night. It was roughly 2 AM, I was having a friend sleep over, and my friend and I were playing with our Barbies in the living room. Now, the dining room and living room are basically just one big room. And on the wall in the dining room section, there were three floor to ceiling windows that had no blinds or curtains whatsoever. So anyone standing outside those dining room windows could easily watch whoever may be in the living room. And I felt like someone was watching us. I turned my head to the right and was greeted by a sight that I will always remember. It may not sound grousome in description, but to an eight-year-old. There stood a man, a white man. I know this because he was wearing a dark blue, short-sleeved t-shirt that had a pocket on one side of the chest. So I was able to see his bare forearms, which were also quite hairy. He wore a black ski mask and black gloves. He had his face pressed up to the window with his hands on either side of his face to block out any glare from the street lights, watching us with such intent. I screamed my little eight-year-old head off and curled into a ball. My friend is doing the same. Sobbing, she asked what we were to do. I said that we were going to count to three and run upstairs to get my dad. We began counting, but I only made it to two and I was hightailing it up those stairs. My friend was hot on my tail. We burst into my dad's room in hysterics, screaming about a man staring at us through the window. He didn't hesitate to jump out of bed and race out to the backyard, where the man would be standing. Of course, by the time my dad got there, the man was gone. Years later, I am retelling this account to my mom. My parents were divorced, but she lived in the area and remembers hearing about an abuser on the loose right about that time in that area. To this day, I am convinced that man was that abuser. I was sitting in the middle of my room, it was an afternoon, and my mom was just outside, talking to my grandma, who lived next door. I was alone, sitting in a chair 8 feet from the TV, I wasn't watching TV, it was off. There was an empty crystal jar on the TV, and I was just staring at it. Suddenly the jar flies in a straight line across the room, and I can feel it scratch my ear a little, it barely missed hitting me right between the eyes. I turned my head to the tiny pieces of glass on the floor. I was so calm because I had no idea what just happened. The jar hit my closet's wooden door. I looked at both the windows and then got up and checked all the room looking for rocks and stuff somebody may have thrown, walked to the windows to check if they were open or broken, and when I realized what had happened, I ran out of the room looking for my mummy. All because of a dog named Muffin. She was a chihuahua slash dachshund mix born 13 months before me. In my early years, I was jealous of the attention that she got. I would pretend to be a dog and beg for scraps under the table and steal her toys. She wasn't fond of me at all. She even bit me a few times. Fast forward a few years, and we're the best of friends. We'd take walks, her and I, down my gravel road. I'd talk to her, probably because I was a lonely child and didn't have too many friends. For years, her presence was a blessing to us. Everything from running around my acreage to consoling me when I was down. She never barked, she was a well-mannered dog. Unfortunately, all good things had to come to an end. It was two months after I turned 14, making her 14, and she began to get ill. She'd throw up nearly all of her food and become thin and weak. When we took her in out of concern, we found out that it was a tumor in her stomach. The news was devastating, I felt like I had lost a friend before she had even died. Muffin had a tumor, and things looked bleak. After a few months of treatment, we had no yield. After short improvement in her health, she began to decline again, and it looked like we'd have to take her in. Muffin quivered in my hands as she enjoyed her last moments in my arms. The vet had prepared the needle that would end her sweet life of selflessness and was raising it to her neck. She looked up at me and didn't squirm one bit as the needle discharged the antidote for life. My friend would be gone forever. Do you think that dogs go to heaven? I asked face buried in my dog's dying hair. My mom just looked at me and nodded, with tears in her eyes. About a year later, I had a dream. My house was dark, and it seemed to have dark curtains hanging everywhere. I made my way down one of my house's flights of stairs and looked to my left, through the dining room and to the kitchen, where there was a light on and some movement. Something else caught my eye. It was a shining object in the dark of the dining room. The closer I got, I realized that it was Muffin. I kneeled down next to her and put my hand on her luminescent body. All good things must come to an end, my friend, she said to me in a voice characteristic of herself. I was beside myself. Just then her body started to float up, up, up into the ceiling and disappeared. I just sat there looking at the ground where Muffin was just standing. I felt a hand land on my shoulder and hold on to me as I wept. Then another, and another until I shot up in bed. 3 AM I found myself breathing heavy and sweaty, 
as if I had just run a few miles. An unsettling peace fell over me, and I lay back down and let my consciousness slip. A few months later, my sister said that she had a dream that she was making food in the kitchen when there was an apparition of Muffin and me weeping beside her. About a year later, my brother said he had that same dream. I thought that my entire family would tell me that they had that dream, but to this day only my brother and my sister have. I like to think that my friend was telling me goodbye that night. And that yes, someday I'll see my friend again. About a year ago, my brother and I were reading an article on the internet at around 1 AM. Parents are asleep in their bedroom, which is right next to mine. All of a sudden we hear the loudest, most blood-curdling scream coming from outside. No joke, this scream filled me with instant, unfathomable dread. My parents' bedroom door shook violently as if it were just slammed shut. This of course causes my parents to jolt awake in a panic. We all run over to the window near the source of the scream, and we see a woman with long hair and a white dress slowly walking up the street, crying and occasionally letting out a loud scream. My dad rushes outside and asks her what's wrong slash if she needs help, but she just kept walking. Dad decides to call the police anyway. When they arrive a few minutes later, they find no sign of the woman. Also, I recently heard the same scream at around the same time of night, although it didn't wake up my parents this time, and I was too scared to look out that window. Still not sure what I was witnessing. Hmm, I have many stories I've heard, but here's one that actually happened to me. I was just a little kid back then, and at the time, I kept some of my toys in a large bag hanging on one of the posts at the end of my bed. One night, I was just lying in bed alone and awake, when all of a sudden, one of my talking dolls, the ones where you squeeze a hand or foot and they say something, in the bag goes off on its own, mommy, let's play house. I was too scared to move and could only get to sleep once my sister, whom I shared the room with, came in later to go to bed. Later, I had my mom throw away that doll. Fast forward a few years. My sister had received a Tickle Me Elmo for Christmas, and we spent a good portion of the evening playing with it. When we were done, we stood it up on the living room table and went downstairs to join our parents to watch TV. At some point, I decide to grab something from the kitchen and go upstairs. As I pass by, Elmo, still standing on the table, goes off on its own, why don't you play with Elmo? I ran back downstairs. Damn it, dolls, I will not play with you. Stop asking me. All right, my father and his siblings used to live in a small town in a very old house. The house was pretty big, but to four-year-old me, it was huge. One of my favorite things to do was to break free from my other siblings and just venture the house. During the last visit to that house before my grandmother decided to sell it, I started to venture into the house like I normally did. Except this time, I don't remember anything from when I walked up to the stairs and went inside my aunt's old room, where all the bedrooms were, to when I freaked out and ran crying, ending up trapped in a room full of pots and pans, my grandmother is very odd in where she places things and is quite the pack rat. After that, I remember freaking out, pounding on the door, sobbing, and begging to be let out. Eventually someone heard my banging and crying and opened the door. Still freaked out over something, I jumped out and hugged my grandmother's legs, refusing to let go. She soon pried me off and led me back to the living room, where the TV was with a lollipops or something. Being a kid, I started to feel better in the matter of minutes, building up my confidence to go for another adventure. Getting up, I headed back upstairs, where all things of interest were. This time though, I only remember from when I got to the top of the stairs to when I ran into my other aunt's room, shutting the door quickly behind me in terror. From then on, I just curled up in her bed, waiting for someone to find me. After I was found yet once again, for the remainder of my visit to my grandmother's house, I never went back towards that room again. I never really thought much of this, though it has stayed in my memory for many, many years until my aunt told me a story. A few years ago, we were in line for a new amusement park ride when I got bored and asked her if she had any interesting ghost stories, since that was the theme of the ride. She instantly seemed amused and said she did and told me how one day when she was younger, she was in her room alone on her bed. It was a pretty normal day, and it was getting pretty late. All of a sudden, she saw this young girl wearing a typical Amish dress just staring at her. She said how this freaked her out, and she had a sort of jealous slash angry look to her. Being completely terrified, she hid under the sheets and just closed her eyes, hoping it would be gone when she opened them later. After that night, she thought it was just her tired mind playing tricks on her and ignored it as much as she could. Later on that next day, she had a friend over, and they were hanging out in her room when my aunt went to the bathroom. Her friend was just sitting there on the bed playing with something when she looked up and noticed the same girl my aunt had seen before. Getting really scared, she closed her eyes and went underneath the covers just like my aunt had. When my aunt came back, 
Her friend jumped up and described the girl in full detail, proving that my aunt wasn't just seeing things. They both were a bit frightened, but figured that since they were always there before without a problem like that, they would just ignore it and try not to be too scared if it ever happened again. This story got me thinking a bit and wondering what happened in that small blank in my memory of that one adventure. I work overnights at a hotel in Minnesota. And in Minnesota we have something called the zombie bar crawl, where people dress up like zombies, just bar hop, basically. My hotel happens to be located right by a bar and is frequently a last stop for these types of events. So I get to work at 11, and it was dead quiet, nobody, maybe, two to three rooms filled total, no noise, no phone calls, no life, and I work by myself. So naturally, I decide to watch some zombie movies, and I wasn't scared, but I admit it was spooky. Then, at about 2.30, half an hour after most bars close, as I'm doing some rounds around the outside of the building, I see maybe 20 to 25 zombies headed my way. So here I am, nobody around, middle of the night, pitch black, outside by a dumpster, and I see 20 zombies come over the hill that connects to the bar's parking lot, all groaning and making indiscernible noises. I mumble oh shit to myself and hightail it back inside, because it never for one fucking second hit me that it was zombie pub crawl day. So I go behind the counter and wait for shit to go down. My eyes are constantly changing from the security monitor to my surroundings. Unfortunately, as I was looking down one of the hallways, one of the zombies had come in through the front door and snuck up behind me. Asked me for a room, and that was pretty much it. I don't believe in ghosts, so no spooky ghost stories. Like I said, I don't spook easy, but the conditions were fucking perfect for that shit to happen. This happened to a friend of mine, but I believe her 100%, she has always been a pretty serious, sober person, never the attention getter type, etc., so when she told me this, I was pretty shocked. She was at her family cabin on a lake in Wisconsin for vacation. Sometime in the late morning, someone rolled her over and tried to wake her up, whispering her name several times. When she woke up later in the afternoon, her family had just gotten back from a fishing trip, gone all morning and afternoon without having woken her before leaving. As they were on a fishing trip, they were all on the boat, so it would have been impossible for anyone to have gone back to the cabin unnoticed, and all of them were baffled when she asked who woke up, as well as extremely worried. She certainly could have dreamed it in the partial awake slash partial sleep mode, but it still creeps me out to this day. My girlfriend has a history throughout her life of coming into encounters of the paranormal kind. I've heard several stories of the things she's seen and experienced, and it really caught my interest. I live in a sectional apartment, I guess they're called. It's like an ordinary two-story house, but it's connected to other similar ones. Anyway, before moving here, the previous owner had been murdered. She came home from work, and as she entered the house, two masked men came in behind her looking to rob the place, brought her down to the basement, and shot her. Her name was Margaret. Fast forward to me living here. I was Skyping my girlfriend one night, and I had moved my webcam to put it at a better angle. After doing so, my girlfriend grew quiet. She had a serious look on her face and sent me a text. I saw her. Saw who? I said. Margaret, I said, where? What did she look like? She told me she was over by my door and that she was a rather thick woman, with long brunette hair and green eyes. Mind you, none of us have seen what she looks like. My girlfriend knows even less than I do, and I live here, and I don't even know the woman's last name. We did some research the next day, and I looked up my address with the word murder. A news article came up, and we clicked on it. Sure enough, there was a picture of Margaret. A thick, brunette, green-eyed woman. I was never so taken back in my life. It doesn't scare me or creep me out. It was just mind-blowing, because I know my girlfriend has never seen what this woman looked like, she barely knew the whole story of the murder. While in college, in Greenville, North Carolina, in 1979, I rented a room in an old, musty, beat-up house with two other guys. None of us had known each other before renting out rooms. The house had six bedrooms, three downstairs and three upstairs. The three of us all stayed in the downstairs rooms. At night, when you looked up the staircase, all you could see was darkness. The upstairs rooms were jammed with furniture, you could hardly get into them. Home alone one night, as I was going past the staircase, I got this weird feeling on the back of my neck. I turned and saw nothing. Then I looked up the stairs into the darkness. It looked like there was a girl in a nightgown staring down at me. I blink, and she just stands there. I scurried into the lighted living room and tried to pretend I hadn't seen what I knew I had seen. A couple of nights later, I'm sitting in the living room with one of my housemates, and our third housemate walks in the room and says, 
Guys, I just walked past the staircase, and I would swear I saw a girl in a nightgown staring down. My mouth went dry instantly. My other housemate said whenever he walked past the steps, he got this cold, creepy feeling like something was upstairs and he was afraid to look. So we got flashlights and decided to go upstairs. We poked around and found nothing. A couple of weeks later, we're sitting on the front porch, and an old man, a neighbor, walks by with his dog and chats with us. He asks us if we have seen anything unusual in the house, and before my housemates can say anything, I ask him, why are you asking? He tells us that about 20 years before, a young girl was murdered in her sleep in an upstairs bedroom. Ever since, the house sat vacant and empty until it sold to the new owner, a 50-ish guy who bought houses around town and rented them out to students, and then the three of us came along and rented the place. People in the neighborhood got a creepy feeling going past the house, and some people swore they could see the young girl, in her nightgown, staring out an upstairs window. The man told us he had met the girl, she used to sit out on the front porch like we often did, and she told him she felt uncomfortable at the house and wanted to move as soon as possible. Her parents went into her room one morning to wake her up and found her stabbed to death. The police could never find out who killed her. Her parents moved away right after. I've seen plenty of weird things over the years, but most of what's happened has been that sort of wake up in the dead of night, see something weird set up where there's no strict way of saying that it wasn't just a vivid dream. The one thing that stuck with me is something that happened when I was around 10 years old, 20 now, living in an old house in Connecticut. It was a two-story home, plus basement. My stepfather had a habit of hanging his hats, and he had several, on hooks above the basement door. It was fairly common to walk down in the morning and find a hat or two somehow removed from a hook laying on the floor. Okay, so and draft knocked it loose. Valid explanation, and the one I generally went with. What sticks with me, years later, is the morning I found a hat clear across the room, against the far wall. One hell of a draft? Maybe. Freaks me out regardless. One, not me, my mom. We had just moved to a new house maybe a few weeks earlier, and nothing out of the ordinary had happened yet though we had some stuff happen in later years that I have a more first-hand account of. My brother and I were at daycare for the day. So my mom decided to go grocery shopping, and she comes home and starts unpacking when she begins to hear a baby crying. My brother was only a year old and I was about three, so without thinking she assumed that it was one of us and went down the hall to our rooms. While she was checking my brother's room, she heard a crash from the kitchen. When she got back, the groceries that she hadn't unpacked had all fallen onto the floor with enough force that some of the jars had broken and the fruit and vegetables had been bruised or completely fallen apart. 2. Flash forward a few years, and I'm now about 7 or 8, and my brother's about 5. We'd recently done renovations on the house by adding an upstairs, and I had a new bedroom. I was the only one with a room upstairs, it was my room, my mother's office, and a few closets. So I was alone upstairs most of the time. I loved it. Anyway, I'm asleep when I hear some rustling from across the hall in the office. My mother is the type of person that follows a strict schedule and is always in bed by 10, and I am naturally curious about what is happening across the hall in the middle of the night. For some reason, I decided that it would be a good idea to investigate these noises without the help of a parent. While I'm walking down the hall, I can hear the noises getting louder and more urgent, but when I open the door, they stop completely, but I still have that weird feeling like somebody else is in the room. I stumble along the wall for a light switch, and I'm still basically standing in the doorway, suddenly too scared to move forward. I feel like cold and moist air brushing against my side. I guess the best way to describe it would be cold steam. I know that sounds oxymoronic, but that's what it felt like. I feel something brush up against my side, not like an actual person or thing but like a bit of heavy clothing, and then it's gone. Though I had been absolutely petrified while all of this was going on, the second it was over, I felt this cold sense of relief slash vindication. Like when you hear of somebody getting exactly what they deserve even though you don't know them and aren't involved in any way. I don't think it was my emotion. I hear some footsteps on the stairs and get really freaked out again, but it ends up just being my dad checking to see if I'm alright, apparently they'd heard some noises from upstairs as well, not the rustling but more like bangs and muted voices. I don't remember any of that, and I didn't say anything or move while I was in the office. I ended up sleeping with them for that night. I was a manager of computer repair for a retailer a couple years ago. We had a client's computer in the back running various malware and virus scans. I was doing morning paperwork in the back near the computer. This PC had its screen saver on displaying random photos from the My Pictures folder, various family members, children's birthday parties, and the usual stuff. Then, from the corner of my eye, 
I swear to God, I saw a picture of a woman from the shoulders up with her throat cut. As soon as I realized what I was making out, I directed my full attention, and it was back to photos of a car show. As the day went on, I thought nothing of it and proceeded to continue my work until I was bringing another customer's PC to the back to work on, and again, from my peripheral, I could have sworn I saw a bloody body bound in the trunk of a car. At that moment, I began to freak out. I grabbed one of my employees and explained to him the situation. We then sat for 10 minutes and watched this screensaver, it is against company policy to search through the client's personal files without absolute just cause. We then proceeded to see a photo of two bodies in a shallow grave out in the woods and another photo of a severed hand down in a kitchen drawer. I then went and got the general manager and informed him of the situation and had him view the screensaver. We then felt that it would be in everyone's best interest to contact law enforcement. In about 15 minutes later, the owner of the computer and another gentleman show up. I proceed to tell him that his computer is not ready and it will be a while. He then informs me that he was called there because someone reported there were some photographs of a grisly murder that we had found. I showed him his computer, and then his partner then began to laugh at him. Apparently he went against police policy and took some of his work home with him and had never noticed his work photos were being used as a screensaver.